Hello there, and welcome to the Construction Revolution podcast. My name is Ali Alizade, and here on the show, we explore the latest trends, technologies, people, and organizations that are revolutionizing or disrupting the construction industry and changing what the industry will look like tomorrow. On this episode, we're bringing you a special panel discussion that originally took place in March 2022 at the Net Zero Construction Conference. This panel entitled Overcoming Roadblocks to a Green Future brought together many experts who are passionate about the future of green construction. You will hear from Brianna Stewart, a construction technology manager at Milwaukee Tools, Dr. Doc Hutton, a professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Civil Engineering, Daniela Mayer, partner manager at Procore, Dr. Chris Scherer, an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the South Dakota University, and finally, Andrew Fahim, the Director of Research and Development at Geotech. As the host of this panel, I can tell you that it is an insightful discussion on how sustainability meets the construction industry and one that I know you will enjoy. Registration for the 2023 Net Zero Construction Conference is now open, so make sure to get your tickets and hear from more industry leaders like these ones. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Ali Alisa, the Geotech uh, co-founder and CTO. Uh, I'm excited to host today's panel uh, entitled Overcoming Re- uh, Roadblocks to a Green Future. As much as the efforts to achieve net zero emissions are increasing, the implementation of relevant technologies and practices uh, in the industry seem to be lagging behind. So our goal today is to understand what are these roadblocks uh, and how we can overcome them. Uh, I'm looking forward to insightful conversations with brilliant innovators we have gathered today. And if you have any questions during today's panel, please feel free to share them in the chat section that um, uh, the panelists can respond to. This is a live panel, uh, and we're taking questions as we go forward. And uh, so it, it, is a, it is a pleasure to host our panelists today with a diverse set of expertise and experiences. Uh, and uh, let's just start with the introduction of our panelists and learn more about their background before we dive in into the uh, panel topic and discussion. So uh, so let's just start uh, perhaps with uh, maybe Brian, please. Absolutely. So I'm Brian Stewart. I'm a construction t- technology manager at Milwaukee Tool. My background is actually primarily in manufacturing and product development. I started off my career in automated manufacturing and then moved into hardware and software development and design and testing. Um, and then at Milwaukee Tool, I've worked in our, our research and development teams and our new product development teams. Now as a construction technology manager, my role is more external facing. And what we do is identify and research technology trends in the industry and develop partnerships to understand how we can continue supporting the construction industry and our end users in adopting technology. Thank you, Brian. Uh, let's go to Doc, please. Hi, I'm Doug Hooten. I'm a professor emeritus now uh, at the University of Toronto in the Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering. My research has been on, I've been there since 86. Before that, I was with the power company. Um, I've been working on cementitious materials, fundamentals of cementitious materials, but also on sustainability and durability performance of concrete, looking at fluid ingress, resistance to fluid ingress, sulfate resistance, freeze-thaw, avoiding alkali aggregate reaction. And a lot of work on developing performance testing and specifications for cement and concrete. I'm also doing research now on, uh, or studying on, on this whole roadblock issue. What are the roadblocks to sustainability? Great, great to have you with us, Doc. Uh, Danielle, please. Hi, great to be here. Um, I'm Daniela Meyer. Um, I'm here from Procore Technologies, uh, Construction Project Management Solution. Um, I sit on our partnership team, our Global Partnerships and Alliances, where um, I lead our climate tech strategy. And what that means is I'm developing relationships with uh, different software companies in the industry that do something in the realm of tracking um, carb. Uh, tracking carbon or waste or um, energy used on a job site um, to 
you know, be the operational model for carbon or for climate conscious decisions. And we're working to build partnerships with these companies. Um, and my background is in start, first started in geography and GIS and urban planning. And then I did my master's in global policy and economic development where I focused on global urbanization and how emerging technology can help uh, developing countries that are rapidly urbanizing in particular leapfrog from legacy infrastructure systems um, to more advanced ones that are more sustainable and democratic. Thank you, Diana. And uh, Chris, Chris. Hi, uh, thank you for having me here today. I'm uh, Chris Shear. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. And so I teach classes and materials and structural engineering, and my research is primarily in infrastructure materials and looking at um, sustainable ways to improve them and also some other things that I'll discuss, I guess, later in this, in this panel. I serve as the faculty advisor for the Concrete Canoe team here at Mines and the ASCE, and we do have a, a Concrete Canoe to compete with this year, luckily. And, uh, you know, having since moved to South Dakota, I've been quite the outdoorsman um, in the summer. I love to hike and then ski in this time of year. So I'm uh, looking forward to speaking with you during this session. Yeah, great, great to have you with us, Chris. Yeah, I remember about the canoe competition, and I'm, I'm sure sustainability is now a factor in designing and, uh, and competing in that. Uh, and last but not least, Andrew, please. Hi, my name is Andrew Fahim. I am the Director of Research and Development at GFX. So my work specifically um, specializes in developments for our IoT sensors, hardware and software, as well as analytics solutions that we are developing uh, for the industry. Some of these solutions basically target our net zero um, goals. Um, my background actually comes from cement and concrete research, but I currently work in a few more areas, including data science and machine learning, our sensor development and prototyping, and obviously concrete testing and characterization. Pleasure to be here. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, have you all with us today in a diverse set of uh, backgrounds and experiences uh, from you know, building power tools to academic research and building software and sensors. So uh, th thanks very much, uh, everyone, for joining us. So let's just start uh, the, uh, the discussion topics. And then obviously, we're going to discuss about the roadblocks to um, achieving this green future that, uh, that we would like to get. And, and, and there are different definitions about green future and green um, industry and green materials. And uh, I would like to learn more about uh, perhaps your vision, uh, you know, on what, what you define as the green future uh, and, um, and, and how that is translated into your area of expertise. So let's just start with Brian. Um, so, you know, at, at Milwaukee, you're uh, working on new tools for construction companies and and I'm sure you know there are many considerations that you have when you're designing new power tools and how uh, net zero emissions or, or green aspects and sustainability aspects play a role there. So uh, it would be great if, if you can learn about your view on what green means uh, when it comes to your area of expertise. Um, yeah, for me, there's a lot of exciting technologies out there. Um, you guys have covered a lot today and will continue to. Um, but where I get the most excited is how it's starting to be just a normal part of our process. It's not green construction or sustainability isn't this side project that's nice to have. Um, I, I see a lot of instances within manufacturing and, and parallels in the construction industry where it's just an expectation. It's how you do business. So when I would run projects, we had regular milestones where we looked at what our serviceability considerations so that our products would last longer, what um, is the byproducts of manufacturing, what can we, where can we find consumers that want to take that um, once it is end of life, what does that look like, where, where do we have um, centers set up where we can do recycling or recovery of, of precious materials. And, and I see that also in, in construction where it's not just at the end of the construction site, you dump all your waste. It's people are thinking, okay, what materials do I need on site? How can I minimize it when there is waste? Where can it go? Um, and how do we think about it as a whole life cycle? So that, that's where I've, I see it absolutely in manufacturing, and I'm excited to see it in, in construction where as you design a whole product, it's part of the consideration. It's not an opt-in or opt-out 
um, mentality there. And I guess with the, the new changes and issues in the supply chain related to electronics, this is going to become even more important. It, it absolutely is. And I know, um, you know, kind of thinking for, we absolutely would not be able to do it without partnerships. So we're, we're very fortunate to have um, other people in the industry that have taken a lead and we've been able to partner with them and, and use their expertise in how to source those materials, how to recycle them, how to manage our supply chain and improve that. So that's sure. Great. Very interesting. Uh, th thanks, Brian. And uh, uh, Doc, you know, you, you, uh, you've pioneered uh, many novel research projects and you know, looking at uh, use of new materials and, and uh, over the past four decades, as, as, you, as you mentioned. And um, what do you predict for the future of green concrete, you know, and uh, working on different types of materials? Where do you see uh, green materials is going to go in the future? Well, it's a good question. Um, a lot of people are working on all kinds of weird and wonderful new materials. But in the end, it's going to be the materials we know that are going to be the bulk of what gets used. So the trick is to use them properly. Um, uh, things like Portland limestone cements that are available now, supplementary cementitious materials, all those are changing, though. The flash supplies are drying up because of coal power plants being shut. Even blast furnace slag is diminishing because people are going to direct reduction steel. So we have to look for new fossilins. Um, but there's a lot of work going on with say, things like calcine clay and limestone together, the LC3 approach. Um, and also uh, optimizing aggregations to reduce the cement paste fraction of concrete. These are things we can do now with tools we have available. They're already allowed in the standards, but people aren't necessarily taking advantage of them. And so what I've been working on is performance specifications. The Canadian standard is largely performance-based, but we need better performance in there to drive. And there's still people that won't embrace performance. So the standard can say one thing, but there's thousands of individual specifications, municipal specs, provincial specs, that throw in all kinds of restrictions, prescriptive restrictions, that prevent that from happening and actually interfere with the process of getting performance. So it's not just about building new materials. It's, it's about using more efficiently the tools that we have today at our disposal. That's right. I think that's where the, the low-hanging fruit is, yeah. using what we have now and doing it better. Because, mm -hmm. you know, weird and wonderful materials, some of them have niche markets, but they're not going to fulfill the, the bulk of, the, of the, what we need for concrete. Excellent. Excellent. Then thanks, uh, thanks for that view uh, on, on the future of uh, green materials. Uh, and uh, let's go to Daniela. You know, as a software company, Procore is basically building the operating system for job sites and, uh, uh, and uh, you, you're integrating with various uh, tools and softwares uh, out there. What are the opportunities in the software area to add the sustainability issues and in, in, um, in particular green uh, future as we uh, want to get to? Yeah. Um... Well, I think so. So a big part of, you know, Procore's um, mission is to be the the tool that's used across the life cycle of a construction project. And that's lofty. And we know that's not we're no we're not going to be the complete solution. And that's why we have over 350 integration partners today, the different software companies that integrate with Procore um, because different tools are needed on the job site. But something that I think um, is really important in the software world, as well as outside of the software world in terms of people operations, is integration. And it's this data sharing, information sharing. Um, I think when we, when you know, you build walls around your data or around your operations, then um, you limit yourself to the possibilities of how you can utilize that data and insights to make better decisions in the future. Um, and when you have everything together in one place, there's more of an opportunity for um, ideas to come from it and learnings to come from it. And I also say that from data in the software world, but also in the people world, because you see the construction industry is really like 10 industries combined. You know, it's from material collection, manufacturing, um, and then there's design, which is so abstract, engineering, um, construction, and then you have operations and management. And we all call this like the built environment 
And it's really one, I think if we get towards a place where we can speak about it together and um, have more of these different expertise people in the same kinds of companies and organizations, then we can better information share and come up with more creative solutions to all of these problems and even look for new problems that we haven't even realized we have yet. And so from a technology and software perspective, I think we can start this process of people coming together by bringing our data together and um, make better decisions. Yeah. No, that's, that's very interesting. It's similar to what Doc mentioned, like we already have the data, we already have the tools. It's about yeah. using efficiently what we have today as opposed to inventing something new. Absolutely. Yeah, I love what Doug said too. There's low hanging fruit and then there's the future like of new crazy materials that should continue to happen, should research should continue to be developed, but that doesn't mean that we don't already have things that we can action on today to improve. Perfect, thank you. Um, Chris, uh, so as everyone knows, the cement and concrete industry is responsible for 8% of global um, uh, emissions or GHG emissions. Uh, and to know, in, in your area of research as a, as a concrete researcher, what do you see uh, are the opportunities in the future of green concrete? Yeah, um, well, as, as you said, I do come at, at this from a materials and structural engineering perspective, and Doug stole a little bit of my thunder here, but I do think, yeah, implementing the current state-of-the-art technology effectively is a good place to start, whether that comes through in prescription. Uh, you know, a performance specs. Um, even simple things like using proper water cement ratio to create long lasting concrete is a challenging topic for, you know, some uh, contractors that I've seen at working with DOTs. And so, um, you know, in terms of reducing greenhouse gases, uh, Doug mentioned a few of these exciting things, Portland limestone cements, basically reducing clinker any way we can, whether that's using less paste, but also um, using SCMs, and I'm collaborating with Doug on a project right now about writing new specifications to um, better allow a broader range of fly ash, um, whether it's, you know, harvested or perhaps um, what some may consider lower quality due to changes in the, the power industry. And there's also some other exciting um, research going on about using infrastructure materials as a carbon sink, um, and I think that, that there's great potential in that. And just making concrete last longer, making more durable concrete is a way to approach, you know, green construction. I worked on a, I finished a project recently about reducing cracking um, in bridge decks. Uh, we, in South Dakota, we were only getting 10 year lifespans out of our bridge decks and that just is unacceptable. Um, and so, uh, you know, using technology that it exists already, but effectively implementing it will hopefully help with that. I also, um, you know, I do research in geopolymers. I think they're an exciting, interesting material, but like I said, I don't think they're going to replace Portland cement anytime soon, and perhaps never, but they do have their place for specific applications. Um, you know, efficiency and structural design is of interest to me. I served on a project recently about looking at steel joist construction and how to make that more efficient. So even small changes like that spread throughout the construction in the whole world can make a big difference. And lastly, I think bio-inspiration is a, a really neat topic. I'm working on a project right now um, researching termite mounds in Namibia and what they can tell us um, about structural design. These little teeny termites create 12 foot tall mounds that effectively serve as um, the HVAC system for their nest underground. And so the structure itself is the HVAC system. And since uh, when we think of a lifespan of a, of a building, much more than the material co um, cost, we have the cost of the energy um, over its lifespan. And so, uh, you know, if we can integrate structures, at the structural um, aspect of a building with the HVAC system, that's a kind of an exciting um, uh, direction. So those are some of my thoughts. Excellent. Thanks for, uh, for for that perspective, Chris. And I think, you know, as you mentioned, addressing the consumption is, is a low-hanging fruit and uh, uh, focused area that, that can basically address uh, most of the, some of the 
uh, GHG emission issues that we have today. Uh, and, um, and Andrew, you, you are working on sensor and software technologies, in particular AI, to look at you know, uh, mix optimization. And again, going back to the discussion that uh, Chris mentioned about more efficient use of existing materials. How do you see the future of frame construction would evolve uh, from your perspective related to those areas? Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm also going to touch on what Chris and Doug mentioned. We have goals specifically for, for timelines that are coming very close, like 2030 and 2050. So if we really want to hit those goals that are approaching us, we really need to start with the low-hanging fruits. And we know for a fact that just because of the availability of resources, we have a very limited set of materials that we're going to be able to use even for the very near future. Um, so things like Portland cement are going to stay with us pretty much forever. So what we need to do and what, um, what we focus a lot of our research here at GFAC on is really ways that we can develop models, mathematical models or algorithms that allow users to basically utilize the materials that they currently have. So we as an industry generate enormous amounts of data. So we produce concrete thousands of billions of tons uh, every year. And the whole idea is this generates significant amounts of data that sensors can capture. And with this data, we can go and basically build models that allow um, end users and allow concrete producers to better utilize the data that they have and to better use even alternative materials that are currently being developed. So if we can incorporate the specifications as well as the data that's being generated by those producers on a daily basis, uh, we can really allow them to get a, a algorithms or mathematical models that allow them to optimize or formulate to the lowest carbon footprint or to optimize their mixes that they are producing every day. Thank you, Andrew. Um, very, very interesting viewpoints on the future of uh, green construction. And uh, you know, uh, I'd like to continue on the similar topic. You know, you've identified various areas uh, for the future of, uh, of our green economy and green industry. And um, uh, I'm sure that you've already identified roadblocks uh, uh, where you see our um, preventing from achieving that uh, that vision. There are lo some low-hanging fruits. Why we don't have those low-hanging fruits already achieved? You know, what are the roadblocks there? And uh, so we're going to continue on, on that topic. But before getting to, um, to that uh, second stage of our discussions, uh, for the people who joined us uh, in this panel, uh, you can ask your questions on the chat area, and uh, we'll be happy to add them as we go forward. Um, so let's uh, let's just start uh, with with Doc. You know, you. You have, as you mentioned, worked on many standard bodies, uh, CSA, ASTM, various uh, guidelines and uh, standards have been developed uh, under your leadership. Um, you know, how do you see standards playing a role uh, or maybe roadblock in achieving a green future uh, as fast as is expected? Well, so, yeah, it's an interesting point. People think of standards as roadblocks, but I think in a lot of ways, some standards are ahead of the game. They're not the roadblocks, it's the people that use them or don't use them that are the roadblocks. The Canadian standard has been a performance standard, uh, and largely we use that performance standard since, what, 2004? Um, but that's not true in the U.S., for example. Um, the building code in the U.S. is largely based on structural safety. It's not based on lasting a long time to bring Chris's point in about long-lasting structures. I'm now, I've helped form a new uh, code committee at ACI on durability design code and we're working towards getting that in place for the next code cycle in 2024 um, and that will address those issues which are different than the issues that 318 addresses with the, with the structural code. Um, there's a bit of pushback, though, because people see it as interference. So it's a funny, uh, the jockeying within the standards community. The, um, the, the biggest problem, I think, is, like I say, implementation of the standards. We have performance standards, but a number of agencies or specifiers are not comfortable with that because they've had these legacy prescriptive standards in place for the last hundred years. They want to control... Uh, even something like the slump on job site. Why would the specifier specify the slump when that's a contractor issue? That typically leads to people adding water on site because they can't place the concrete. And that leads to all kinds of durability problems. Um, minimum cement contents. We don't have that anywhere in the Canadian standards or the U.S. standards. 
but many municipal and provincial specs do. And so they override our ability to re do innovative things to reduce the cement content of the, or the clinker content of the concrete. Even aggregate proportions. We allow, we should optimize on total aggregate gradations to minimize paste content, but a lot of specifiers won't allow that because some of the materials you might use to make that change are not in their spec. And so they just eliminate it because it doesn't meet their prescription. So there's things like that that could be done people would just get away from these legacy prescriptive things back from when ag agencies were the experts. Now it's the industry, the concrete producing industry that has that expertise. And the contractors are moving forward too with design, bid, build projects. They're using all kinds of innovative things, such as the sensors that you're talking about, to optimize, accelerate construction processes, um, uh, things like form stripping, uh, reshoring removal, uh, column climbing, if you have the instrumentation in place, you can do in situ measure, get in situ real time information that allows you to accelerate vertical construction. And so those things are, and a lot of, and things like thermal control plans using instrumentation to prevent thermal cracking. So big contractors are already doing that. And I think because the instrumentation is now cheap and accessible, more and more even small contractors using this technology. So it's very encouraging. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very interesting. So it's, it's about implementation of the standards as opposed to anything else and moving moving away from prescriptive measures to more performance-based measures to, to leave the hands of innovators uh, open to come up with ideas or a way that they can achieve that final performance with new approaches or making more efficient use of material, as you mentioned, or or other optimizations that um, uh, that are possible. Uh, so, so uh, do, do, do you, who do you think is this responsibility falls under? Is it the, the government? Uh, is it the um, academic? Is it the industry to lead the way? Well, I think education uh, along the whole value chain is really important. If you introduce any innovative project, you've got to convince the specifier, but you've also got to end the designer, uh, the owner. Um, you've got to talk to the... Uh, the concrete producers are, are pretty up on innovation. At least the industry is fairly progressive, largely because of the vertical integration, I think, has led to that. But the contractors need help. If there's something new, it affects their construction process, their processes and scheduling, they need to know about it. Given the people on the, like floor finishers, if new products affect how they finish the flooring or the, the timing of the finishing, they need to know about it because otherwise it'll lead to failure and, and rejection of that innovative material. So that, that there is going to be education uh, along the, the whole food chain, if you like. Very interesting. Th thanks so much, Doc, for sharing that, uh, that view. Uh, so going to, to Daniela, uh, you mentioned about massive amount of data that this industry has. And it, as, you, as you put it nicely, it's probably 10 industries combined in one, one sector. Uh, what are the, the roadblocks that you see uh, in terms of getting that data, using that data to generate new insight and knowledge um, you know, from, from your experience developing uh, uh, software solution for job sites? Um, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to echo Dr. Doug here because um, I think implementation is really key in into using actionable data um, and also education along a, every single person involved in this process and all the industries as well about the importance of accurate data collection. Um, for example, there is a paper I was recently reading actually by um, a professor, a research professor at University of Toronto, um, Shoshana Sachs. She, it, it was a, about BIM and embodied carbon. And so, for example, people, you know, champion BIM as a way to measure embodied carbon and estimate it prior to a project's um, con construction phase. Um, but then looking back at this project, it was a bridge project. It was like looking back at it, you know, throughout the um, construction process, there were all of these moments where, you know, more materials were ordered than were required to um in the in the bridge and um you know ver various things along the cycle for example like bim didn't include you know steel rhubarb for some reason and so then the 
end result of the embodied carbon compared to the estimated result was over 200% off. And so this is where, okay, we have data in the beginning that looks very accurate, and this is what it is. Look how amazing, amazing projections we can use with software. But then if we're not tracking it throughout the construction process and verifying that data and updating the BIM model by the, you know, boots on the ground people who are on the job site, the data is not going to be accurate, and then you you don't know what the actual embodied carbon estimate is of the bridge or building or what have you. And so I think, you know, my points here on the roadblocks are just going to just going to um, echo his because it's data implementation and understanding of why it's so important to accurately track what's happening throughout the life cycle of a project from the, you know, environmental assessment to the uh, design, conceptualization, construction, and maintenance phases, as well as education. And because a lot of times what we what we really see to at Procor, and Procor has a .org arm where we offer continuing education courses to the industry for free, where they, you know, they're accredited and they can go on their resume. Um, and so we really try to help the industry continue to advance because the reality is, Software and technology is only going to be used to how the user can benefit from it. And if the people who use technology aren't technologically literate, then it's not going to be very useful. So it's a combination of implementation and education to really using this data appropriately. Definitely. And do you think, uh, you know, when it comes uh, to sharing data and getting that data to basically uh, develop new algorithms or new insight, there's always this question, you know, about liability and ownership of IP. You know, do, do you see those as roadblocks uh, to getting the data that this industry has, billions and billions of data points that different companies have, but they, they're not sharing it because of those roadblocks? I do. I do see that as a roadblock. Um, and you know, I think because of my because of my background in um, studying aspects of the industry that were more public sector oriented when it comes to, you know, urban planning and global policy, um, my perspective is that, and I said it earlier too, I think collaboration to innovate. And I'm just going to bring up the example of Bell Labs. It was a, you know, if, if, you know, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was a research center um, by um, AT&T, and it was heavily government funded, you know, um, and while AT&T was a private entity, they had a monopoly on the telecommunications, but the government heavily funded it and required that AT&T put a lot of their profits into research and development, which literally gave us the Internet and our modern tele way we communicate with each other. And I think that we need to do this for the built environment. And so I don't think it's I don't think it's on technolo technology companies or some sort of green New Deal. I think it's going to be a huge collaborative effort to actually get towards the green future we need to get to because innovation is by, you know, by nature collaboration. Well said. Uh, thank, thanks, Daniela. So going to Chris, um, uh, Chris, uh, you as a uh, professor, you have tons of ideas and new research topics uh, that you'd like to pursue. Um, you know, what are the roadblocks that you see from um, for preventing your concrete ideas come to life? I mean, no pun intended, but your concrete ideas come to life. You know, <laughs> you have to throw in a concrete pun every time. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I wanted to just take a one step back to one of these questions here, just real quick, if that's okay. It was like, how can we learn from ancient Roman concrete? And, you know, the Pantheon, I, I teach about Roman concrete in all of my classes. I can't get enough of, it, enough of it. The Pantheon is such an amazing building. But I was thinking of the roadblock to Roman concrete was the Dark Ages. So, yeah, hopefully we don't have one of those in our future. But, um, yes, I, to answer that question, we can certainly learn a lot from Roman concrete. But they did have one big advantage in terms of durability, the fact that they didn't use steel, and steel corrosion, of course, is a major issue in our infrastructure um, today. But we can visit that again later, too, if, if you want. 
But I, I do think there is some slow implementation of innovation in the design and construction industry. Sometimes I get frustrated when I talk with my colleagues in, in fields like computer science where things get uploaded like the week after they develop it and then it's just out there. But, you know, there there's um, a reason that we're a little bit slower and Doug brought it up and it's, you know, safety of public. If we had to update a bug in our um, bridge every two weeks because it wasn't working, I don't think that would be a very sustainable way of doing things. So I think um, you can't just kind of build infrastructure and then fix it later. It has to, we should do it right the first time. So, um, you know, change costs time, it costs money, you need to have extra skills, but I think we can, we can uh, work to achieve all of that in a way that is still profitable for industry. And I, I agree with Doug about moving towards performance um, specifications to enable the green future. Um, here in South Dakota, um, our, our DOT has some prescriptive um, specifications, but they want to change, but they need help changing. And there's a little bit of hesitancy, but the industry is really pushing that because Things are happening like not reaching, you know, concrete strengths even based on um, you have to follow this very um, strict set of guidelines. And when you do that, it just doesn't work. What if we tried something new? And so there will always be this push for innovation. But, um, you know, in terms of how we overcome those roadblocks, I think we'll talk about that a little bit later in this discussion. But that's, um, I guess, where I'll stop for today. Thanks, Chris. Um, and uh, so going to Andrew, uh, you know, we, uh, obviously we talked about uh, some of the roadblocks and conventional methods, and, and you're working in the area of AI applications in the concrete industry. So, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure you have seen roadblocks in getting uh, even more advanced or things that are not common practice today into the market. And, and so, what are the roadblocks that you see uh, in, from your perspective in getting to that? Um, green application using sophisticated sensors and um, software solutions. Yes, yeah, so I guess it's very similar to what Chris mentioned. I mean, we are in an industry that's very high risk and high capital intensity. So obviously the fear of anything that's unknown or the fear of something that was just developed in the past two or three or five years is, is very valid and very reasonable. We cannot blame people for, for having this fear when we're talking about you know, public safety or, um, or health and safety. So. Um, things like we've always done it this way or why fix it when it's not broken, it's, it's, it's very normal to hear. So um, I think we all, again, it comes down to collaboration. We all need to work together to sort of embrace um, newer technologies that may not yet be proven, but in a, a, in a sort of boundary that's safe for us to, to do so. So these new technologies that we develop, they, they, they have to take all the boxes before they are being used. So they cannot only... Not only do they work, are they reliable, uh, do they compete with the business as usual, but they also need to provide significant value and be profitable uh, for people that are implementing them. So not just being a green product, being a green product does not cut it. So um, in a sense, we need to take all these boxes before we present this to stakeholders or we present this to, um, to people that are going to implement um, these technologies. So I think um, some of the things that will tremendously help will include like Collaborative partnerships, obviously academia builds a lot of these technologies and build the fundamental um, research behind this technology. Government bodies or, or uh, specification bodies actually help us with the implementation of this. So really opening the conversation, opening the collaboration between these parties will be one of the most important things um, that we can do to get these um, things out of the door and get them in, in people's hands and get them to use them. I think also government plays certainly a significant role. So considering that they are the biggest, uh, by far the biggest infra infrastructure um, spenders, um, obviously their decisions and their policies play a very significant role in how um, we embrace these technologies or how we implement these technologies. So I think there's a lot of effort that can be done on the government side or the policy side that can really help these technologies um, proceed outside of just the, 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 uh, the specification uh, bodies. The other thing that I wanted to mention is obviously when we talk in, in panels like this, usually the first thing that comes to our mind is North American or maybe European governments or, or, or specifically these countries, but we have to focus on things like developing countries. So these countries have, um, you know, a lot of the, the infrastructure is being built there and we need to actually provide incentives for these countries as well to embrace these technologies and move forward. Um, so I'm going to stop it here. Thank, thank you, Andrew. And uh, Brian, uh, so, you know, 
most of the time, I think bottom line is the top priority for companies when it comes to making a decision, right? And in and, and, uh, a lot of cases, making green decisions is going against that. And um, I don't know if, if you see this as a roadblock or this, are there any other roadblocks that you can identify uh, from, from your experience uh, in, in job size or construction companies, uh, preventing them using green technologies or green approaches when it comes to uh, power tools or other things? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you're right on that. A lot of times green technology is viewed as something that's imposed upon business. It's not um, something that co can coincide with profitability. And, and part of the, the roadblocks there that I've seen um, both in construction, like I've talked to project managers that didn't understand why a certain concrete was specified in. And when they couldn't get it in stock, they ordered whatever they could and they put it in and they got their project launched on time because that was their, you know, driving objective. Um, and I, I mean, I've experienced that. I've designed and launched engines, power tools, and while I never individually wanted to launch something that wasn't safe or didn't have service parts associated with it, when you are driven by other metrics, sometimes it is hard to take that time and make sure that you are doing your due diligence if you don't have the support structure within, within your company. So even if the corporation has a high level objective, if you don't have milestones and resources available to support the individual contributors that might have conflicting de deliverables, that's a, a huge roadblock. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Um, so very interesting and different roadblocks that have identified uh, in, in today's panel. Uh, and again, for, for the audience uh, listening, uh, I think uh, if you have questions, I think there's actually one question for Doc, and we can respond to those questions as we go forward. Um, the, uh, in the second or the next uh, part of this discussion, uh, we would like to maybe discuss how those roadblocks can be uh, removed. You know, construction industry, as we all know, is very, very is slow to change, is, uh, is resistant to adopt new technologies, and maybe rightly so. There is a, there's a lot of uh, liability uh, that is here. You know, if a structure collapses, there's a lot of liability associated with that. And, um, and uh, because of that, in most cases, people, as Andrew mentioned, they're saying, we've done this for many years. It's worked. Why do we need to change? And there is always a risk that comes with that change. So. Uh, and we're talking about all kinds of changes that we would like to do to get to that green future and the, the roadblocks that you identified are preventing us from getting there faster. So in this uh, part of the discussion, we'd like to maybe get into how we can remove those roadblocks. So, so let's, uh, let's just start uh, with uh, Daniela. Uh, so again, going back to what you just discussed about um, data and uh, getting that data, maybe clean data, accurate data. What are the roadblocks that you, uh, or uh, what are the um, solutions that you identify uh, that we can implement or use to remove those roadblocks? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the construction industry does move really quickly. Um, and so it's a matter of, you know, I don't think you want to come in um, and say, hey, to a company, for example, and say to a construction company process and say, hey, you need to change everything that you're doing, um, but slowly start to show the individuals that if you change certain processes, it will also improve um, your day to day. And so, um, you know, being at Procore, you know, Procore's overarching mission is actually, you know, not not necessarily related to the industry. It's to improve the lives of everyone in construction. And I think that's um, a, a noble mission because it kind of says that we're not trying to revolutionize what you do. We're trying to make your life better and help your process in what you do. And I think that that really speaks to the industry and people are really receptive to that over saying you everything you're doing is wrong and you need to change it. Um, and so then when people see how technology and digitizing their existing processes, literally just same processes, just making them more digital improves their improves their day to day. And then they're able to 
callback information easier and look at di how different projects ran and make Im small improvements on future projects, then they'll be more willing to adopt different types of technologies in the future as well. And um, I also think that it, along the lines of collaboration and, you know, breaking down sort of department and, um, you know, industry silos or sub-industry silos, um, it would always be helpful for companies to have somebody as like an innovation or R&D person, somebody who's out there looking at what the new stuff is, testing it out, talking to other people and saying, you know, what what could be really helpful to our process. Um, so, or even if you're a construction company that doesn't do design at all, maybe have a design person to just be there to give their insight and to better communicate with design people. Um, so that, that would be something I would say is like a small way to help us get there. Um, for example, though, I'm, um, you know, I'm at Procore, which is a private company, but, um, I'm, you know, joining different types of councils that are, you know, for, that are in the public sector, and I'm communicating with different types of professors in academia and research, and that's just a way that I think every individual as well can just try to try to sort of embody this um, this forward-looking thing to widen their horizon, rather than get really narrow and siloed in on a certain aspect or subject, um, so that we can communicate with each other better. Thank you, Daniela. Um, Chris, uh, you, you mentioned, you know, obviously there are some technologies or research projects that are been undertaken at, at the academic level, and some of those require education in the market, as you said, like some, some even end users don't know how to implement the results in their practices. So, how, in addition to education and more more training, uh, um, what what are the other roadblocks that you see? Are preventing uh, the fruits of academic research getting into the industry um, as, as fast as possible. So um, yeah, we're here in our so-called ivory tower um, and developing all of these in interesting and cool things. And then you know, when I go out to a construction project, there's still someone you know just laying rebar, bringing the concrete in, vibrating it, making sure it's finished properly. And there really seems to be this disconnect between the two. And so I do sometimes. And so, um, you know, you say in addition to training, but I do kind of want to focus on training right now. ACI, American Concrete Institute, has certification programs. And I'd love to see more of those developed. But really what that needs to happen is more projects need to specify that people working on the project do need those ACI certifications because it really creates a baseline of knowledge and skill level for, um, you know, contractors and construction workers. Um, when you're building something in a, a manufacturing facility, there's a, a high level of precision and, uh, you know, repeatability. But in field construction, which is what primarily happens in our industry, I think there's uh, a lot of room for mistake and uh, non-precision, if, if that's a word. And so um, making sure that there is this base level um, skill set that everyone working on a project has so that um, we can actually translate these high level ideas down to actual implementation of these ideas. You know, I have an annual concrete conference here in South Dakota, and most people who work with concrete in all of Western South Dakota, we all gather in one room and we talk about the state of the art and we think of ways that we can bring that into their practice, even in a region of the United States that's, you know, less known for innovation. There are innovative things happening here. Um, so it's slow, but changes are coming. And I think another way it, to overcome these roadblocks, and when I think of the physical analogy of going around a roadblock, you, you come up on a road, you have to go veer off to the right or left, into the weeds, things get a little messy, <laughs> risky, and then finally you can get back onto the road. And so it's not easy, but it's worth it to get by, by it. And so if we reframe, you know, green construction, as a way to be profitable or a way to save money, as Brianna was saying, I, I think they, they can be one and the same, even with the risk embedded in that change. So thinking of projects in terms of life cycle costs instead of an initial cost, 
I keep bringing up our DOT, but, um, you know, state governments have annual budgets they have to meet, and they don't necessarily think 50 years in advance all the time. Uh, some of, you know, many DOTs do. But, um, you know, even minor change like using stainless steel and bridge decks, which they did implement, had, uh, you know, three times high of cost initially, but that bridge is probably going to last um, three times longer. And so they will save money over the, that period of time. And so thinking of it from more of a holistic standpoint instead of just an initial cost, um, I think is also a smart strategy to overcoming these roadblocks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. And I think an interesting thing that uh, Daniela and yourself mentioned is this, on, on, the, on the receiving part, and you know, we need to uh, have that sort of social, maybe environmental responsibility as end users, as companies, private companies, to start implementing um, those positions or guidelines, you know, to um, to receive. Like, you know, as much as education can happen, certification can happen, the the receiving end of it has to be also um, ready to accept. Uh, and, and be ready to adapt to new technologies or new guidelines that are more um, geared toward green construction. So, Andrew, what are the uh, solutions that you uh, can identify to remove the roadblocks that you identify? Yeah. I'm maybe going to start just by a few examples of things that, um, that did overcome the roadblocks and some things that come into mind, um, including, for example, Environmental product declarations, like these things were just a concept or an idea maybe just a few years ago, and now they are becoming a lot and a lot more uh, of the norm. So I see this as one thing that really successfully overcame um, its roadblock, where people are now delivering concrete with, in, in, in a lot of cases, with a, an environmental product declaration. And for those of you that haven't heard of it, this is sort of like a, um, a nutrition fact sheet, but from a sustainability point of view, showing this product that you are getting, um, what's the carbon footprint that it has. So I see a lot of people start to understand that this is not just, you know, a burden on them. This is not at all a burden, but people are using this as sort of a differentiator. So as a concrete producer, I'm differentiating myself from others that are around me by having this. It actually has a significant impact on them, a significant financial as well as a marketing impact um, on them. Other things that have also overcome this roadblock, things like supplementary cemetery materials. Again, these are things that years ago were just considered byproducts, things that we just have to take care of or things that just can go into concrete instead of being a waste. But now a lot of people are, re we are realizing now that we're running short of them that these are things that are very useful for us. They actually have longevity in terms of durability and service life. Um, so in a lot of things, I think it comes down to just communication, how we communicate the value and the impact of, of these solutions um, that we that we make and present. So I think a lot of the collaboration from the academics that that really do the fundamental work behind this, all the way to specification bodies or DOTs or governments, um, can really push these technologies further and can remove the roadblocks, uh, such as in the examples that I mentioned. Okay. Um, yes, I, I guess in, in a way, you know, we're, you know, sometimes uh, I refer to this as uberizing the industry. Like there are there are solutions that, that can be implemented today, you know, to um, uh, to change what has been done for hundreds of years. And, and, and when Uber and Lyft came to the industry, taxi industry was there for hundreds of years, and uh, there were a lot of challenges, legal issues, you know, uh, and things like that. But at the end, um, the industry was Uberized, so to speak. And uh, in a free end, do you think? construction industry can go through a similar uberization. You know, things have not changed for many years. And we're talking about changing uh, perspectives, education, implementing new materials, uh, new technologies, changing the uh, prescriptive approach to more performance-based approach. What, what do you think uh, can happen to uh, remove those roadblocks from your perspective? Yeah, I, I'm actually... Uh very optimistic about the the construction industry. I know we get a bad rap um, for being a slow adopter behind in the times. You know, see see the comment in the chat about people not wanting to take pride in their work. But I also tend to challenge people and say, like, when were you responsible for a project that of a building that people were going to live in and their lives depended on it, the buildings around it depended on it? It's a really high stakes industry. With, with low profit margin. So even when people are well-intentioned, it can be difficult to take those risks and the potential downside of taking risks are just huge. 
um, the, the liability and the, the risk of human life that comes along with buildings um, is a big hurdle to go over, um, which is very understandable, but when we look at like how can we overcome that, I love all the things we've been talking about here. So collaboration, partnerships, no one can really do it by themselves, but I do think there is a lot more appetite to collaborate between private and public industry with regulatory bodies. Um, I know at Milwaukee, we're a big company and we can't do it ourselves without the, you know, like Doug mentioned, without the standard setting bodies. We wouldn't be able to investigate every material that we put into our products and decide what's hazardous, what's the appropriate recycling process. Um, even a, a straightforward initiative, like we want to recycle our batteries and recover the materials, it's not something that we were structurally set up to do. So we find partners in the industry, and there are more and more emerging. Um, there are continually more um, enterprises that are trying to figure out how do you take waste and turn it into something profitable. Um, you know, I'm really excited for some of the direction that our manufacturing facilities are taking um, in improving that collaboration. So when we go to build a new facility, we immediately partner with the local energy company and see, okay, what is the energy sources? Where is it coming from? If you don't have renewable energy, what are your roadblocks to do it? Can we sign a letter of intent? Can we sign a commitment for a certain um, amount of time that will then enable you to um, invest in renewable technologies? Because, again, it's, it's not even necessarily that the energy companies didn't want to. You know, we build facilities in small towns. They don't have the resources or the, the financial cash on hand to invest in, in a solar farm. Um, and that's where we look to partner with them. We can't build a solar farm ourselves, but we can financially contribute and commit to a, a long partnership with that city that will then enable that. And, and then there's more and more, with all that, there's more and more success stories. So I do think the narrative cha is changing from it's, it's not detrimental to business. Like Andrew said, it can be a um, competitive advantage. Chris and Daniela both gave examples of where we can take data from operational costs and justify those upfront decisions with that change to the design. So I, I do think the narrative and the understanding that green technology can future-proof your business, it can help your local communities, it can um, improve national security. I don't think um, the, the current environment right now just highlights how diversification of energy sources is a, a national priority whether you're in business, private, public, um, government entities. So I, I do think that narrative is changing and the availability of partnerships will help contractors move to a, a greener future. It's very promising. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. Um, and, and Doug, you, you, you mentioned, you know, you, over the past four decades, you've worked on various standards and some of them have been implemented, some of them have not. And, you know, I'm sure you have tons of stories and lessons that you well, we can share with the audience, you know, what, what, are, what are the examples or maybe lessons that you can share with us uh, where there were um, cases that a new standard got implemented very quickly and what can we learn from that to implement the next guidelines related to green technologies in the industry? Well, it's interesting. We, um, I can give you one example, the Portland Limestone Cement. We introduced that into the Canadian Standard in 2008. It went to the American standards in 2011 uh, based on the work that we presented. But getting DOTs, for example, to implement that has been challenging. We still have one DOT in Canada that won't accept Portland limestone cement after, what, 13 years? Even though it saves 10% of the CO2 emissions, and it's basically plug and play. You can replace Portland cement with Portland limestone cement. Nobody's going to know the difference. But they just... They can't get past it. And the DOTs in the U.S. are no better. I went and spoke to the Caltrans in 2016. I almost got laughed out of the room. But then they funded research at Oregon State for three years. And in 20, November 2021, they finally said, okay, well, we've proved it in our backyard, so now we're going to allow it. So they're like the last adopter. They, they were state number 40 out of 50. So the California talks about an environment, but they're like last adopters. They're not first adopters because they're very conservative on that end. And for no, no real reason, they just didn't believe it because it wasn't invented there. Mm -hmm. So that, there's that sort of thing. But I wanted to go back, if you don't mind, and address some of the issues. This pride in the workmanship issue is, because I've taught floor finishers, I've taught truck drivers. Um, and 
the reason they don't have pride is because nobody teaches them anything. They don't know why it's important, what they're doing, why, what, what they're doing, why is it important? Nobody tells them that. So they don't tell them, well, if you don't do this right, it affects the product this way. They just say, do it this way. And so that's a whole different dynamic. And when you tell them why it's important, they take an interest in it. They start to take pride because they understand why. But how many people train their laborers? You hire a bunch of guys off the street. To, we have an itinerant workforce in the construction industry for, to a large part. And so that, that works against us unless you train them. But how many contractors train their laborers and explain why things are important? So I think that's an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, back to the Roman thing, in addition to the lack of steel that Chris mentioned, um, they also had a pretty benign environment around the Mediterranean. Other than seawater, there's no freezing there for the most part. Um, they also had a pretty heavy um, building code. Basically, if you didn't do it right, you got put to death or your family got put to death or something like that. So they did interesting things. They used pozzolans. They used crazy admixtures like animal blood that actually entrained air in some cases. Um, so they did things. They didn't know why they did it, but it worked for them. Uh, but they did interesting things. So the, the other issue about Roman concrete is that really looking at the stuff that lasted. 99% of what they built didn't last. Um, and I think if we looked at today's structures, we'd probably find that 1% or 2% that lasted a 1,000 as well. But, you know, so people, I think, overbuild. I mean, there is stuff to learn there, but I think we've probably mined it already. Um, the last thing is that last comment to me about the aggregate gradations. The problem with aggregate gradations is con aggregate producers produce for the whole construction industry. They do it for the concrete industry, the asphalt industry, and for um, granular base. And guess who gets first dibs on the aggregate? The asphalt guys, because asphalt... The, the asphalt will fail if you don't have the aggregate gradation really tight because you minimize your AC content to 5 or 5.5%. Five and, and so aggregation is huge to them. So they get the first pick at the aggregates. The concrete people get the second pick. And they're typically left with 20 or 25 millimeter stone and some sand. But they quarries make waste material that doesn't meet the gradations. They sometimes call it screenings or chip. That material can work as the intermediate aggregate to help that gradation. We've shown you can reduce cement contents by 15% just by throwing some of that chip in the middle of the aggregate gradation. And that's huge. And it's basically available, but some DOTs won't allow it because that chip doesn't meet the gradation requirement of an individual material. It's exactly the same material as the coarse aggregate, but it doesn't meet the gradation. So they say, no, you can't use it. So people are putting 50 or 60 extra kilograms per cubic meter of concrete, cement in their concrete, because they won't allow it in contracts. We've seen that in Ontario for sure. So it's an interesting business. So I, I want to just address that. But I already mentioned the education thing. I think the instrumentation thing is the other thing that's going to come, and your, your company's involved in that as well as others, that is moving, driving construction forward to be more efficient. Um, I think that's huge. It's making a lot of headway, um, as I mentioned before. Anyway, that's what I got. The, um, what else did I mention? It was something else. Oh, Danielle mentioned something early that, that that I picked up on was this whole thing about not quite meeting the goals you set for yourself. The, the, the reality isn't the same as what you planned on for some of the, the greenhouse gas reductions. But I think that gets down to, like you say, boots in the ground, or ins I call it inspection and feedback. If you have proper inspection on a job site, um, you pick up on these things and you fix things before it happens the, the next time, even on the same job. Well, Typically, concrete inspection on a job, people think of the hiring inspection company. They come in and they measure the slump of the concrete, maybe the air content, and they go away. That's not inspection. It doesn't say, well, is the rebar in the right place before you place the concrete? Did you get the ice out of the forms before you place the concrete? All these little things, is it the right workability to actually get in the, the form work? All these things that don't get inspected, that need to be inspected, and sometimes the contractor needs to have their own inspectors to make things work. Otherwise, you just repeat the same errors every time because measuring the slump in error is not going to give is not inspection. It doesn't improve construction. So that's my my bit. <laughs> yeah, right, right, and I th thanks so much for sharing that experience. You know, from from your background, I think this, these are very these are very very interesting insights about different areas of industry and how uh, you you see more we can what we can learn from that in overcoming the roadblocks uh, of the future of green construction. So um, uh, the, ne the next part of the discussion, I would like to 
uh, maybe for the audience uh, who are here, and most of them are students and the younger generation who are uh, getting into the industry and they're into the workforce. Um, how do you think we can inspire them? How do we, you know, we, we, we have a responsibility to pass on this experience to the next generation and educate them and, and train them uh, to build a better world uh, for, for, for our future? So uh, I would like to learn uh, maybe from your perspectives on how we can inspire the next generation of um, workforce and students uh, in, in our industry. So. Chris, uh, you know, as a professor, you're obviously teaching a lot of students, uh, younger generation. Um, how do you see this? Uh, uh, how do you see them to be inspired about new um, green technology or green future? Yeah, so like you said, I have the privilege of teaching and mentoring young minds just about every day, and I see they're excited already about green design and sustainability. It's their future, and so they're hungry to make that difference. And so I, I think it's it's a lot about cultivating that passion. We have a, a minor here in sustainable engineering that is, is quite popular. I know some of my students have gone on to get master's degree in sustainability. And so the, the passion is there. It's just giving them the opportunity and skills to be able to use it. And secondly, I think we need to change the messaging about getting into engineering and construction. If you ask a physician why they want to become a physician, it's because they want to help people in general. Um, but if you ask, you know, an engineer, why are they going to engineering school? It's like, oh, you're good at math and science. Okay. You know, why don't we change that messaging to be, oh, why don't you, sh you could become an engineer and help other people and improve the world. Um, I think that's a much, much better um, way to sell engineering and we just don't do it currently. Right, right on. Um, Andrew, uh, you, know, you, you have a strong collaboration with the universities and you know, you're, you're dealing with um, a lot of, I guess, students and co-ops uh, who are joining your group. You know, what do you see you know, as, as uh, being inspiring to them uh, in this area? Yeah, I, I think the younger generation coming up they, doesn't need too much encouragement. They have like a contagious enthusiasm and like a really good belief that they're going to change um, the world. So I think they're, they're doing fine on that. I've, Personally, I've been lucky throughout my very short career to have amazing mentors, professors, supervisors, and people that really hold environmental concentration as one of their core values, and they live by it. So I, I think mentorship plays a very significant role in, in how we build those ideas on about the environment and sustainability. Um, but I, I think we also should be a very good example for these younger generations and how um, you know we value this and how we stand by it every single day. So I, I also want to echo what Chris mentioned. I think engineering and science curriculums have a much better, have ways to go um, to basically position sustainability at the core of it. It's not just a course or two that, that engineering students are taking now, which really should be the core because of the very significant problems um, that we are facing right now. So I just want to give, if I give advice to a younger generation, just to, to know that every decision that you make will play a very significant role in how this whole thing uh, plays out from a sustainability point of view. So. Um, these goals that we are planning to achieve will not be achieved just with the current generation, but I think this upcoming generation will play a very significant role in it. So even the smallest day-to-day -day, day -day decisions that you take uh, can make an everlasting impact. Excellent. And uh, Brian, you know, the younger generation is raised with digital technologies, mobile phones and you know, apps and things like that. They demand technology. You know, do, is this something that you think can be leveraged to inspire them about green uh, future in the construction industry? Yeah, I think it absolutely can. And I think that's where um, industry has to pivot is understanding how can we best use the, the skill set and the enthusiasm of um, the generation that's entering the workforce now and how can we give them the best tools to be successful? Um, so, you know, we have a, a pretty strong contingent. We, we've been doing a lot of hiring over the last year, so we have a past few years. Uh, so we have a, a strong contingent of very socially active on digital platforms of employees. And so part of what we try to do is if you are interested in, you know, social issues or sustainability or, or diversity, how can you, you take that enthusiasm and your digital skills and affect real world, world change? So um, how can we help enable you to actually make change within the industry that 
may not meet all of your expectations uh, when you come in. And so how do we maintain the um, enthusiasm without you know, creating a media disillusionment when things aren't meeting, meeting the bar um, that, that you're aiming for is how we try to balance that. Perfect. And, and Doug, you know, in addition to be uh, um, a professor and you've trained many students who are now professors and you know, researchers and, and uh, holding it, this, you also were involved and pioneered uh, standard bodies and uh, playing a big role in getting uh, new technologies uh, into uh, Do you think the new generation, uh, or how, how do you think, think we can bridge a gap of bringing new generation to standard bodies and guidelines so that there is a continuity with all the amount of work that you've done over the past 30, 40 years in the standard community, for example. How that continuity can be kept so that the next generation can continue developing those standards and guidelines? Oh, that's a good question. We have, it's funny, when I joined ASTM, I was the youngest person on the concrete committee. Now I'm like the oldest person on the concrete committee. <laughs> um, uh, that's what 40 years will do to you. Um, but people do join. The trouble is that to get involved, you need to travel to the meetings. And a lot of companies have cut back on their travel. They're sending fewer people to those meetings, all the standards meetings, um, which means those people aren't necessarily getting the opportunity. Now, you see things at ACI. You see a lot of students, hundreds of students showing up at these annual con or semi-annual conventions. And that's great. But after they get hired, maybe not so much. Um, sort of going sideways a bit. The young people are enthusiastic. Chris made a great point, and you can, they're all keen on sustainability and environment. I, I see the same with my own students. Um, but the problem is that when they graduate, they then go to work, and they're stuck with, they're almost like lock, locked into the knowledge they left with. Because what I see with the people that are making the decision making people who are 30 years later are actually controlling some of the decisions in the in the process are stuck in what they learned when they left school and so i think it really speaks to the need for lifelong learning by the industry so that they can keep up and learn and adapt to the changes that are going on right on. Right on. Very, very very good point um, th thanks, Doug. And, and uh, last but not least, Daniela, um, you know, uh, on this topic, you know, um, I attended actually a few of Procore Groundbreak um, events, and I'm amazed by how many young leaders you have at the company. And, and you're, you know, they're excited about changing the industry, uh, developing new technologies and, and solutions. You know, how do you inspire so many young people uh, to be excited about uh, the the future of our industry? Um, well, you know, I, everyone's kind of said it here, like climate change is a very serious issue, perhaps the greatest issue we've ever faced is, you know, humanity and the younger generation, um, myself included, uh, we know this. And, you know, I, I think that that alone is motivation. Um, so I don't think it's, too hard to inspire people and get people excited. I think the trick is, and so I didn't realize though that there would be a lot of students um, uh, listening to this, which is really great. And I want to use this to just give like three nodes of advice that I've taken um, in my path. And um, I would, I, I, I think it's important. Um, so one I would say is, uh, don't don't drink the Kool-Aid like I think, you know, a lot of these companies will say, oh, this is the solution for the future. This one thing, this one technology or additive manufacturing is a lot of a lot of promise. Um, but where does it fit in? Is it the right situation for everything? And I think that what we need in the younger generation is nuance and understanding that, um, you know, that everything is probably going to be a perfect solution in a niche environment and just have the awareness that don't don't get overly excited or fall into a rabbit hole of one particular future keep yourself open-minded and realize that there's likely space for a lot of these different future solutions and it's a matter of finding where and how we all they all fit together in a puzzle um 
And then two, don't let the, like, once you get into the workforce, which Doug was talking about too, it's like, once you get into the workforce, it can feel stifling how the systems haven't changed and the processes are still the same. I felt that myself coming from my master's program where it's just nothing but people who are so excited about the future, researching things, writing things with passion. And then you get into the workforce and honestly, like 60 to 70% of the people at the company don't actually care too much and just want to get off at five or six because they have a family and get, want to get to their life. So I would say to students who are excited and want to get back out there, don't let these, don't let the other people in the company around you dictate your path. You can, not to sound too corny here, but like you can really create your own path. And I created this climate tech strategy at Procore and I'm leading it. And I've been really lucky to be supported by the leadership in this process, but it was something that I thought was important and I went rogue and now it's a real thing and everybody can do that. You just have to just, you know, don't listen to the noise a little bit. And then three problem seek. I think we also talk about all the time about problem solving and how we have all these existing problems we need to solve. But what is a potential solution today could ricochet into five problems tomorrow. And so I think also adding to the nuance of don't go down a rabbit hole of what one particular promise is, but keep yourself open-minded and look towards the long-term future. Thank you, Daniela. And I guess that was all the questions I think for today's discussion. Uh, at the end, is there anything, one last thing that you would like to leave our audience with, uh, Andrew? I think if, the one thing I took out of this is really um, collaborative partnerships and collaboration will be the way for us to really, it, it takes a village for us to make a small impact um, on the climate. So I think that is really the, the way to go. Brianne. Yeah, I'd echo that. It's an exciting time to um, be in construction. I know I'm excited to be in my position at this point in time. And I think um, there will be, more and more coming out of just the availability of data and partnerships um, that will drive the, the green industry. Doc? Well, Jack, all that, it's an exciting time to be in this industry. And I'm sorry I'm sort of towards the end of my career because it, there's so many things happening so quickly that it, it's really exciting and there's so, much, so many good things that can happen if people get involved in this. Thank you, Doc. And uh, Daniela? Um, that the built environment um, is not separate from the natural environment. It's all one together and it's a great industry to be in. So we, I think can do a lot more to make this industry more appealing and, you know, just as prideful um, as being a physician like Chris mentioned. And last but not least, Chris. Yeah, I was thinking, Doug said he's 40 years into his career. I was thinking 40 years from now, I hope that, you know, if we have a panel discussion like this, we can talk about all the really cool things that have changed since, since now. Okay, great. Uh, that Doug set us up for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so that's all about uh, all the time that we had today. And uh, thanks, everyone in the audience for joining us today. Um, I hope the session was as informative uh, as it was insightful and uh, you were inspired to take away key learnings back to, to your own field. Uh, and a big thank you to our panelists uh, for joining us today and for sharing uh, their journey and passion for sustainable practices. Uh, please check out the rest of the upcoming uh, talks beginning shortly and have a great day, everyone. If you have any questions, uh, we can stick around uh, for a few minutes. Uh, but that's, uh, that's the wrap for today. Thanks very much. Thank you.